seem to go, but you don't know what you've got till it's gone. They paid paradise, put up a parking lot. They paid paradise, put up a parking lot. They paid paradise, put up a parking lot. <laughs> Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to a special educational event on biodiversity, the essential survival strategy for the climate crisis. My name is Anne Christine Strugnell and I am the communications director here at the Environmental Forum of Marin. I'd like to begin with a really brief acknowledgement that here in Marin County we are in fact on unceded traditional homelands of the Coast Miwok people. Environmental Forum of Marin has been running for about 50 years now. Our mission is environmental education and advocacy training. Basically, we want to help people who live in this beautiful place to understand it better and to protect it against the many things that could degrade our environment. Last year, we did a series called Forum 2020, which focused on the climate crisis and educating people about the causes and consequences of the climate crisis. And this year, we're running Forum 2021. So no surprise to any of us, sadly, the climate crisis has not been resolved. Um, but what we're doing this year is we're, we're looking at it through a slightly different lens. We're looking at it through the lens of biodiversity because biodiversity, or I should say biodiversity loss, is one of the biggest consequences of the climate crisis. And conversely, protecting biodiversity could well be our best hope for resilience in the face of the climate crisis. Then we're moving on to Justin Robinson, who's going to be talking about the intersection between people and plants. Okay. So here is what I'm gonna to put together for you. Now you, you, you probably have not heard this in this form. So I'm gonna allow yourself to digest it. The loss of biodiversity, I mean globally, is directly tied to the loss of indigeneity. I'm gonna say that again. The loss of biodiversity is directly tied to the loss of indigeneity, right? As indigenous peoples of the world are, have been, are, will be displaced from their homelands, Right? This means that there's a loss, not to those people, but it's a loss to the ecosystem in general. Now, we've all heard the statistic. 5% of the Earth's population, indigenous people are 5% of the Earth's population and protect 80% of Earth's biodiversity, right? So we've heard that a bunch. But why in the devil are there so few indigenous people? How do they only, how do they only currently make up 5% of Earth's population questions, right? How does this happen, right? The, here's the question, is the de-indigenization of human beings the reason for the loss of biodiversity? Now, we're going somewhere, stay with me. What is de-indigenization? De-indigenization is the displacement, the replacement, or assimilation of people indigenous to a particular part of the earth. Okay, so what does this have to do with us? Why are we talking about this now? We're talking about the context of the United States here in this thing, because we're not talking, we while we're talking about in the global framework, framework, we're here in the United States. Unless you are indigenous to Turtle Island, which is what indigenous people here call it, you are an indigenous person who has been displaced to here, okay? I'm going to say that again, unless you are indigenous to here, you have been, you're an indigenous person who has been displaced to here, okay? And this is the result of European colonization, all right? In fact, the climate change crisis is the result of Western European colonization and the subsequent industrial revolution, which all go are wrapped up in the de-indigenization of peoples around the world, right? That starts first in Europe the de-indigenization, the loss of the sacred forest of the Druids, the loss of the sacred forest of the, of the, of Donner's Oak in Germany, 
right? The displacement of Scottish people, the displacement of Irish people who then had to flock in droves to what is now New York, right? Displacement of indigenous peoples causes the loss of biodiversity. Now, that sounds all sounds rather depressing <laughs> because it is, and it's true, right? We can't, un we can't move forward until we actually understand what happened. How did we get into this particular version of this mess? Okay, so here's the question. Is there a reversal to the law of biodiversity? And, because if, if, we, if we go back to the premise that the loss of biodiversity is, lost to the, is, is directly tied to the loss of indigenous people, right, and indigeneity, the ways of indigenous people, then the, the, the natural question would be, is then there a reversal of the indigenization? And the answer to both of those is yes, of course, right? How? 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 Let me tell you my own story. So I am clearly a person of African descent, right? My ancestors were captured in what is now Nigeria and displaced indigenous people to Southwest Nigeria, displaced to Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, where I currently live, okay? We are indigenous people who Europeans tried to de-indigenize. So what is the process of de-indigenization? This is the process of changing names, changing language so that you don't know your sacred plants, you don't know your food, you don't know your, your clothing, um, your clothing to traditions, you don't know your sacred traditions, that is the indigenization, right? And so that you then have to rely on some larger entity to be able to supply you with the basic needs of your life. This is what I mean by this. The basic needs are food, clothing, shelter, medicine, those sorts of things, right? All over the world, indigenous people provide, the, those things are provided locally, right? So, how did this happen and how did this apply to people? Like, this is my story, right? I am lucky enough to know exactly where my people come from and for our indigenous culture in my homeland to be alive and well, right? What does this mean for people who are of European descent, right? What happened to that indigeneity? Part of that is, 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 is locked in, in hidden in plain sight with a lot of stuff uh, around Let's take the instance of fairies in the British Isles. So many fairies are associated with flowers. Let's take the bluebell. So with that cosmology of indigenous people of the British Isles, what is now the British Isles, you weren't supposed to pick bluebells, right? So what does it mean? What is the ripple effect of not, of having an area that is off limits to human beings? This is very common among indigenous cultures around the world, by the way, is to have places that are off limits to human beings. Okay? because of a spiritual aspect. And so those pieces of that indigenous cosmology, the way of seeing cosmology, the way of seeing the world, helps and helps to continue to protect biodiversity. You can take the example of Iceland, right? Who will move roads, right? Or change road plans because elves you know, exist in a particular place. That is part of the way of a cosmology, how they see themselves as being a part of a particular place on the earth, not as sovereign, not as dominant force, but as a part of, that is the indigenous framework, again, and I mean this globally, okay? And so this is about how to be in balance. The loss of biodiversity is directly tied to the loss of indigenous people, right? And indigenous management and science and all the things that go along with the long history of a particular people in a particular place of the earth, okay? So if the people go, so will the plants, right? If the people have come back, the plants can come back too, okay? So I will leave it there. Again, I know you have probably never heard this in this form before. This is, might be new to you. And because I've had such long 
my own journey and my own long relationship with indigenous people who are indigenous to here, I know this to be true. 